some people are like, oh, pff, it's just porn. What's the big deal? Well, what's the big deal is this is destroying relationships. Whenever a guy contacts me, this is usually the context. Either the wife is threatening divorce or he is kicked out of the house or divorce is imminent and they're just, I'm their last ditch effort to save the marriage, to get them off porn. And so I can tell you it destroys relationships. Hello, welcome to another episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health, a free safe space for people to share and learn from others' experiences with mental health and addictions. I'm Todd Redebaum, a suicide attempt survivor and a recovering substance abuser. You know, I've never actually liked that term, substance abuser. When, when I hear when, when I hear the word abuser, I think of like, you know, super negative things like I was violent or something. Maybe compulsive, compulsive substance user. That, that sounds less negative to me. I might, I might use that for now on. At any rate, I'm glad you're here. This is a, a really great episode with Eric Zuzak, or better known as Powerful Eric. He'll explain all that. And I have to say, he's pretty uh, brave. Not a lot of people out there would openly let the world know that they are a recovering porn addict. Uh, he explains what that was for him. He's also a podcaster himself. He has a porn... Oh, up. Yeah. <laughs> he has a podcast, not a porn cast. Uh, a podcast called Porn Talk. So okay, it's kind of a porn cast, I guess, maybe. Uh, and he also helps people uh, with addictions mostly sex addicts and porn addicts and he talks a bit about that coming up here and if you want to watch this episode on youtube you're more than welcome uh, all you have to do is go to youtube look up the channel bunny hugs and mental health and there's all types of episodes there on there including this one so uh you can go do that if you'd prefer you can also rate and review the podcast if you've been listening for a while and you're like, hey, I, I like checking this guy out every once in a while. Well, this guy, I don't really do much. I like checking out this guy's guests. Uh, then, then please go to Apple Music or iTunes or whatever you're listening to this on and you can rate and review. And I, I'm telling you, rating and reviewing is highly important for podcasters. Uh, so whatever podcast you like or enjoy, make sure to rate and review them. It's incredibly important. It helps with algorithms and charts and uh, finding guests and, you know, all types of stuff. So please rate and review your favorite podcasts. Okay, let's get into this. Uh, so without further ado, I give you Powerful Eric. I am a sex and porn addiction recovery coach. I was a porn addict, raging porn addict. Oh, well, what, what does a raging porn addict look like? Uh, means burning days, like getting up in the morning, starting to watch porn, skip breakfast, skip lunch, gets to dinner time, I'm starving, put a pizza in the oven, burn the pizza because I've got the uh, blinders on and uh, go eat the burnt pizza and get back to it. Mm. Burning days. Yeah. And pizza. <laughs> and pizza, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe some rug burns. I, that, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> that doesn't make much sense, I don't think. I don't know. <laughs> uh, kind of. So how, how did that how did that start for you? Like I I'm was it when the internet kind of became popular? I'd started uh very young. I uh, you know, I was Masturbating at a very young age, and then uh, when the internet came around, you know, it was kind of like crack cocaine because, you know, like when I was a kid, this was pre-internet. I thought if I had like a Playboy magazine, that I really had something, you know. And <laughs> uh, now, you know, they don't even make the magazine anymore. It's it's so soft to what's out there that you know it's pretty much dead, as far as what I understand. And uh, so, yeah, uh, the, the different thing about like a VHS tape or a DVD even is that there's a, there's a beginning and an end. But with the internet, there is never an end. There's always another woman. There's always another picture. There's always another video. 
And so the three things that are unique about porn addiction is one is novelty. So there's always another woman. There's, there's, our, there's always something new, something different. Two, yes, you can pay for it, but it's free. Basically, you know, so novelty, it is uh, free and it's very easily accessible. Most people don't walk around with, I mean, of course there are people that do, but most people don't walk around with alcohol in their pockets and, and drugs in their pockets all the time. But you carry, if you carry a cell phone with you, you're carrying with you the world's largest internet porn library that has ever been made. So those three things make for a very challenging addiction. Think about it. Like if this were, if it were drugs and alcohol, if it was free and novelty, always something new with it. And where's my brain? Novelty. Oh, and just easily access. accessible. Like you could just yeah. at a moment's notice, you don't have to go to the store. You don't have to go anywhere. It's just right there. You have bam, drugs and alcohol. Every time, every moment of the day that you could possibly want with something new and different all the time. Imagine that. That's porn. Yeah, yeah. Well, I remember when I, I so I'm in Canada and I'm in Saskatchewan and this province was 18, was legal age to rent porn. And I remember turning 18, my buddies and I think it would be funny to go rent some porn. And I mean, it was a big deal to like drive to a place. And then it was like, it's kind of embarrassing and you go in there and then someone sees what you're renting and it was like a real, you know, it was, it was uh, a lot of work and you know, you needed, I want to say balls to do it, but you know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly um, what you mean. I've, yeah. You know, I've done yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is embarrassing. And they have these doors that like that buzz you through, be, you know, because there's <laughs> people of ill repute coming through and so they have to have the doors all locked and under security and cameras and... Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. And then, not, yeah, like like you said, it's just. I mean, when they, when they when you, when you watch movies, sci-fi movies from the '90s and '80s, they get some stuff right about what the future is going to look like, but they don't. They never talk about how accessible porn is. Yeah. So who knew? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's only just begun. This is own. This is uh, uh, Internet porn, it's only just begun. It's, it's in its infancy. And the reason I say that, um, and this is a whole big thing, is artificial intelligence. Um, it's uh, already changed the landscape with porn, uh, whether you know it or not. And whether, even if you you don't even, if you're on porn uh, tube sites, you're already being affected by it. You don't even know it. It uh, is manipulating what it sees, what, what you see. And then on the other side of it, there's the, you know, the basically make your own porn type of thing. And um, it's very disturbing. It's, it's, it's so, it's, a, it's more of a hook. You know, I talked about the, those three things that make porn so addictive. Well, we ain't seen nothing yet because now that artificial intelligence is here, we're going to see new levels of addiction and I just said this in a recent podcast on my podcast, Porn Talk, that um, if you are addicted to porn and you want to stop, now is the time because, like, get out now while you can because AI will trap you in that matrix and don't know if you'll be able to get out. Huh, interesting. Yeah, and uh, again, no one ever talks about porn when they talk about AI in the future, um, something I never considered. Like, uh, are you saying like, it'll be like, you could just type in whatever it is you want to see and it could be any movie star, any whatever. And yeah. you basically create your own. Yeah. Then that's available now. It's, it's available at this moment. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. That's wow. what I'm saying. Uh, that's why I said. Like, if you are wanting to quit porn Get out now because the tools of AI that are available and that are and and it's and the same thing like like if if porn or if internet porn were a person I guess it would be I don't know a toddler but uh, AI AI is barely an infant it's it's like it's in an fact, embryo it was just you know 
just uh, an infant that was just born. And uh, we're we're going to see some crazy, crazy shit going on. Like, oh boy, uh, it's 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 really disturbing. And then you know all this stuff with sex sex trafficking. I I tell you, that's one thing. When I first got into this, to to heal myself, mm -hmm. um, you know, I researched and all this, and the thing that I came across is sex trafficking. And there's a movie, a documentary on Netflix, I forget the name of it, that tries to divorce sex trafficking from the porn industry. Of course, made by the porn industry. You know, they, they created the film. Um, although I don't believe they actually take credit for it, but they clearly made it. And they're trying to say, there is nothing to see here. Sex trafficking has nothing to do with the porn industry. These are all willing participants. There is nothing to see here. And yes, of course, there's time, there's, ones with willing participants. But for, as far as the big, the big industry, um, they are, appear to be the, the por por pornographers, but really they are the money launderers and for the big crime, big, big, you know, drug cartels and things like that. So when you are clicking on a porn video, you're clicking a big thumbs up for organized crime and, uh, Murder and uh, big time, you know, drugs. Just bad dudes. Yeah, yeah, bad, bad, bad dudes. Hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I heard a a podcast a while back where it was a woman who, I think she was drugged and stuff, and they made a film, and I can't remember if she she must have been a. I don't know if she knew it was being filmed. That's what it was. I think she was a willing participant, but she didn't realize it was being recorded. And then somebody put it up on um, Pornhub. Mm -hmm. That's a – anybody that knows porn, that's a big porn site. Porn. And um, and then other people – because you can just like screen record and then take that video and share it yourself. Mm -hmm. And it, it, like her video was uh, I don't know how many times on Pornhub and then, yeah, all hell broke loose with Pornhub and, and uh, sex trafficking and underage girls and all this stuff and – yeah, it was almost better regulated when it was like you had to drive somewhere. And Yeah, um, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. And I tell you, you know, some people are like, oh, pff, it's just porn. What's the big deal? Well, what's the big deal is this is destroying relationships. I, Whenever a guy contacts me, this is usually the context. Either the wife is threatening divorce, divorce or he is kicked out of the house or divorce is imminent. And they're just, I'm their last ditch effort to save the marriage, to get them off porn. And so I can tell you it destroys relationships. It destroys relationships. And uh, also. And pizzas. And pizzas. <laughs> uh, so not to mention, like, let's, let's say you could healthfully use porn. Like when I first started to, to do, do this for a living, to help men recover, I honestly, I honestly thought there was still a healthy use of porn. But after doing what I do and seeing what I see, it's like, okay, let's say it is healthy for me to watch porn. Okay, like I can handle it. It's not affecting my life in a negative way. Well, then what about the people on the other side of the camera? Is it good for them? The, the woman that was sex trafficked and then got it purposely got her addicted to drugs so she would perform on camera. Is it good for her? And then so I get to whack it to this woman that has been sex trafficked and drugged for film. Now, yes, you could say, oh, but there's all these other willing participant women. Yeah, there is. But how do you, how can you discern? When you go on the tube sites, there's no way of discerning uh, if this is like homegrown porn or big industry porn because they purposely make videos that look like they're homemade. Like that's the intention. They want this to look like, oh, Bob next door just got out his phone and started filming. So that's a kink for guys or something? Sorry? So that's a kink for people is that that it is homemade, not well produced or I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so that's why the porn industry gives it that – Twist. Yeah. And of course, they, they make the professional looking stuff too. Mm. But my point is, mm. is that you can't, there's no way to discern the regular person next door as opposed to the professionals. 
And uh, when I th th went down this whole rabbit hole of the sex trafficking, it is so disturbing. The thing about me that really makes is the kids, like the kids is a big part of it. And uh, like the Jeffrey Epstein, you know, his whole mm -hmm. deal. And now P. Diddy, if you're following that story, P. P, P. Diddy, that whole sex trafficking thing there. And uh, those two guys are just the tip of the iceberg. Like, you know, the, it's really disturbing, man. So you went from burning days to thinking it should be better regulated or just not have it at all? Well, one of the good good things that is happening now is um, some of the states are trying to pass legislation just to have an age limit, you know, like you have to be 18, you know, so like these kids, I have children contact me that are addicted to porn because they don't even, they don't even know what it is. And, you know, their brain is hijacked. Now I, just to be clear, I don't coach children. I have a resource that I send them to. They're great. Um, but so yeah, there's, there's no reason whatsoever that any child should be watching porn. You say, well, what about sex education? Okay. There could be well done sex education v videos that doesn't have to do with whacking it on somebody's face. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, mm -hmm. so, um, kind of lost my train of thought there. Um, <laughs> yeah. well, actually this was a question I had for, uh, do people with neurodivergencies, ADHD, et cetera, are they more susceptible yes. to porn addiction? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, uh. I have a client, uh, with that diagnosis and yeah, absolutely. Yes. Interesting. Okay. I, I, I just had a feeling I'm, well, I'm a former, I'm in recovery myself with addictions and I was just recently diagnosed with ADHD. So I'm just, I'm doing my own research, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah. Speaking of doing your own research, I did go down the traditional route, which was get yourself a regular therapist, go to, 12-step meetings and put yourself on antidepressants, did the traditional model, and I actually got worse because I would go to these meetings and I'd learn, oh, there's porn like that? Oh, there's a website for that? Oh, you did what? Because they would talk about all the stuff that they did because uh, this is how you'd introduce your yourself, you know, depending on the multiple programs I went to. I'll just pick this one. Hi, I'm Eric. I'm a sexaholic. Um, I'm powerless over porn. It's been X amount of days since... Uh, I acted out last and this is my worst behavior that I've ever done. Uh, and that's, that's how you'd introduce yourself. And so I started to identify not just as, you know, having an addiction, but that I was the addiction that I am, I am an addict. And there's mm -hmm. a big difference. There's a huge difference. Like if you're, if let's say there's a horse and that's the addict horse. Okay. Um, and I get on that horse and I'm addicted to porn, but then I get off the horse. I am not the horse. I'm not the, the addict, you know, there. It's just, that's something that I did road, you know? So, but with these meetings, I became the horse, I guess you could say. I became it. And that didn't work for me. And it, what the thing that was so frustrating for me is in the literature, it says we were powerless whatever it was, we were, it says past tense, but I can guarantee you any meeting you go to, it will be interpreted as we are powerless. So one day after almost 20 years of 12 step meetings, 20 year, 20 years, I was logging in. I was making a login for a recovery app and I just decided, you know, I'm going to make my login, my screen name, I want to make my screen name Powerful Eric. And in that moment, pitiful, powerless, porn-addicted Eric died and Powerful Eric was born. I don't call myself Powerful Eric out of ego. It's out of having called myself a piece of poo and powerless for decades. And little did I know that that small change would change my life and countless others, literally men around the globe. And so I say, if you're in a 12-step meeting and that's working for you, great. But I have one crucial piece of information for you. When you're introducing yourself in that meeting, say, hi, I'm Eric. I am a recovering 
whatever it is, sexaholic, alcoholic. I am a recovering whatever. Because if you don't have that word recovering, then you are that, you are that addict. Now, in the beginning, there is a tremendous amount of merit to doing those things and saying those things. In the beginning. Mm-hmm. But if I you've agree. been in recovery for five years and you're say, still saying, I'm an alcoholic, 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 I'm a sexaholic, I'm a sexaholic, I'm a sexaholic. Guess what? You're going to be a sexaholic, alcoholic. That's what you're, that's, that's your world. So just put in that world, word recovering. I also agree on that. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I was definitely grateful for the twelve step groups, and it got me to where I am today. Um, and COVID hit after two or three years sober, and I haven't been back. I'm, fi- I'm, eight, I'm eight years sober now, and uh, I agree. I was like, you know, I don't think I need the twelve step groups anymore. I don't. It got me here, and I'm pretty good actually it would be might yeah that that language over and over again could be damaging to some people and everybody recovers different everyone's addiction is different but um but yeah whatever works for you do it yes um yeah introducing the timely children's book sometimes daddy cries the visually stunning book is told through the eyes of a boy whose father suffers from depression he sees his dad get sad rest, and even go to the hospital, all while comparing his father's depression to a physical ailment. Sometimes Daddy Cries is getting rave reviews from parents and mental health professionals alike. One critic has stated, This is a timely and important book that will help countless fathers and sons broach the subject of depression. An Amazon customer commented, An excellent book to open up a conversation with a young child about depression in a parent. Sometimes Daddy Cries is available in hardcover and paperback on Amazon.ca and Amazon.com. I'm, I'm curious. You said you started masturbating at a young age. I'm curious how what how young oh, a young very, age is. Yeah, very, very young. I, I'm talking like long before I could ejaculate. You know, long before I could orgasm. I'm talking like four. Yeah. 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 And because I because I can distinctly remember when I did finally orgasm, like whoa, like what, wow, like what was that? Like that's never happened before, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. So I was already a comp- compulsive masturbator, but then porn comes and shh. and I got to say this is this if someone if you are in a committed relationship and you you have if you're able to have consensual sex with someone, uh, healthy sex, and you want to get rid of porn, masturbation is the gateway drug to porn. Because I, I've tried it both ways. Like with masturbation, without masturbation, I tell you, uh, when I, if I say, oh, I'm just going to allow myself, you know, I'm going to, it is inevitable that it goes back to porn. So if you are trying to stop watching porn, I strongly advise you to drop the masturbation. It'll be easier. It'll be easier. That's why I say, like, if you have, you know, a healthy sexual outlet, that'll be a lot easier. Right. What if you don't? What if you're a single guy and you're having trouble meeting women? I guess part of the trouble is because you're at home masturbating all the time. But... Well, and you you just brought up a fantastic point. So if you're a single guy and you're at home masturbating to porn. So this is the real truth. Like, let's say you go out for an evening with some friends. There's an attractive woman, attractive girl that you'd like to go on a date with. But there's a part of you that's like, "Uh, she could turn me down. I don't want to get turned down. And you're maybe you're having drinks and you're like, yeah, I'll just take care of that later when I get home. So you don't approach women. I mean, this is a real thing. This is a real thing. 
Well, I believe it. I, I wonder, like, you hear about these um, incels? Who are the terrorist guys that are, like, virgins and they hate women? Um, and I can't think of the name either, but I know what you're talking about. Do you think maybe porn has something to blame in, in their minds? Uh, absolutely. Or, yeah. I mean, there's no question. I mean, think about it. There's a group of guys that decide, you know what? We're swearing off women. They're just a lot of trouble. Um, you know, they just want me for my money or whatever. So I'm just not going to date ever again. I'm not going to get married. Well, what are they doing? I mean, so uh, you know, realistically, like, what do you think they're doing? Are they all just? They got to release somehow, I guess. Yeah. I guarantee you that is a large group of porn addicts, man. Large yeah. group of porn addicts. It's and, driving me uh, nuts what that term is. <laughs> it, is it incel? Maybe it is incel. Uh, I'm not sure. God damn it. Now now I'm bothered. Um, <laughs> so I I, I, uh, I have two young, wow, to me they're young, uh, 19 and 17-year-old sons. And I guarantee you they've probably been watching porn since – well, I have no idea. I guess I have Since no idea. So the average age is actively watching 11 years old. Wow. Um, what advice would you give parents to <sighs> kids, of well, whether it's female or a male, whatever? Talk to them about it when they're very, very, very young. I've got a book called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures. It's made for toddlers. And then there's a Good Pictures, Bad Pictures um, for older kids and talk to them about it as soon as like I started talking to my one son, I've got two sons, my one son, Alexander, when he was about four or five and he loved the little book. The, the little book is really well done. Um, it has, you find little things throughout the book and he actually enjoyed the book, believe it or not. Um, but I have conversations about it very early on. And if they're older, still have those conversations because it, it destroys relationships. So have conversations with them. Um, I really honestly believe how people view cigarettes is how people are going to view porn. There's not a soul on the planet that doesn't know that smoking cigarettes is bad for you. Like we all know that. Well, there's going to be a time where people go, I'm like, yeah, you can go on your computer right now and masturbate to porn, but we all know that's bad for you. It, it, the time will come. It's definitely not here now. I'll tell you that. Yeah. So when you say have conversations with them, what, what, what's, what's maybe something you should say in that conversation? Like for me and my wife, I'm, I'm a guy. I had access to pornography when I was probably younger than the average bear at that point too. And, uh, and so anyway, what I told them was like, okay, this is going to happen. You're going to come across this stuff. I'm sure people are, you're going to masturbate. You're going to experiment, but just know that it is all bullshit. It's all fake. This is not real life. This is not what women like. This is not the way you treat women. This is not how you do it. It's all just fantasy bullshit. It's like watching an action movie and just know that if you are ever out and about looking at porn, I guess. Yeah. Well, one of the, the challenges is these young kids that really don't even know what it is, they want to imitate what they see. So the big thing that's going now is child-on-child -child, uh, perpetrators. Right. So so they they see it and they want to act it out. And uh, so that that's a big thing. And hmm, how do I say this? Without, I'll just say this. There's someone that I know. Uh, recently that with speaking code here, um, a friend was uh, trying to do those things with other friends and like, this is just P Diddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, maybe I should have just skipped that part, but my point <laughs> that I'm trying to say here is like, this is, this is hap This happens on your street, in your neighborhood, like not in someone else's neighborhood. And like on your street, the kids there, the next street over, there's kids that are watching porn that are going to want to experiment with your child. Mm -hmm. That is not good. Well, I'm 
somewhat open about, I've talked about it, I guess, before in other episodes that I've experienced some child on child sexual trauma, I call it. I don't feel like I was ever preyed upon or that, you know, I was like groomed or anything like that. It was just a shitty circumstance. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know it was trauma until I got sober, to be honest with you, because it started to like come up in my brain <laughs> once I kind of cleared, but, but it is trauma. And, and I mean, I, re I remember actually seeing my first moving pictures of people having sex and it's still, that was almost a trauma. I don't know. It's me too. I distinctly remember. Pardon me? I distinctly remember. I know the name of the VHS video. I saw it on. I still remember mm. the label. Uh, also, when the child on child stuff was happening, I mean, I, I drank at a very early age too. Me too. And there was a lot of alcohol and pornography involved. Um, so, yeah. And lo and behold, I had to go to treatment. <laughs> yeah. Do you Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, we're talking about a, lot, about a lot of the challenges with this, um, but there there is hope. Um, and what I mean is there are passing laws. In fact, one state did pass it uh, of at least passing some basic laws like, hey, you got to be 18 to watch porn. It's not your brain, your developing brain addicted to porn, like that porn, that, that, commercial that used to be on this is your brain on drugs you know remember that right. the eggs well this is your brain on porn and it's not good man so that's one thing that's hopeful another thing that's hopeful is the uh the dsm that's the manual that therapists use um for the long time they wouldn't even recognize any type of sexual addiction they still don't recognize porn addiction per se but they do have a hypersexual uh, designation now. Uh, so that's, that's hope that's hopeful. That's helpful. Um, but really the model though, that they used was created in the, the, the disease based model of addiction, uh, created in the 1930s, uh, still used today. That's the primarily what most people use or variations thereof. And, um, there's a lot of more like 12 steps were created in 1934. And that was state of the art at the time, and it's helped millions of people, and we're all grateful that it it's there. But there are other tools now. Like we need a step thirteen, we need step thirteen, and um, I use identity change. I stumbled across it purely by accident, out of desperation. I called myself Powerful Eric. Little did I know there's this whole branch of psychology, identity, identity change. I Anthony Robbins. Love him or hate him, he's helped millions of people. In an interview, he's asked what's one of the number one, if you could only use one tool to help somebody change, what would he you use? He said, identity. Identity change. And that's exactly, that's one of the tools that I love to use is, well, I always use. Uh, but first, there's a lot. Before we get to identity change, though, we have a lot of, a lot of muck to remove, a lot of dirt to move, a lot of poo to move before we get into to identity change. A lot of work before that. But in essence, I have men come up with their superhero name, their power name. And um, guys love it. It's awesome. <laughs> hmm. well, I'll have to think of a power name before we go for me. <laughs> um, is there a lot of, do you find men that were, had sexual trauma that then that turns into hypersexuality, which then turns into addiction, which... Yes. And it's often just what you're talking about, early childhood experiences. However, uh, one of the big one, the thing that is that all my clients have in common is that they're either their dad wasn't there or their dad was abusive or their dad pretty much ignored him. My, my dad was a good guy. He really was, he's a good guy, but his mom and dad, my grandma and grandpa were pretty messed up. And how he coped was by throwing himself into books. And unfortunately he never stopped. He became a PhD in chemistry and he'd always come home, go in the basement, go in his study and put his nose in a book. Um, and my mother would joke that she was a widow to books, even though he was alive and unfortunately, for that what that meant for me is I was pretty much ignored. Now he did. I know he loved me. He did the best that he could do. He's now he's no longer with us, and I love him dearly. 
But the unintended result with a child being uh, ignored, that's almost worse than being abused. So really? that is a, a core where mine comes from, among other things. So, Man, it is fascinating how how people's coping mechanisms from their own traumas can actually mess up the next generation. And you have no idea. You think your dad was probably thinking, hey, I'm – Compared to my parents, I'm doing really well. And <laughs> you just, you never know what the hell. And like I said, too, everybody's different. And may, if you had a slightly different personality type, maybe you would have been fine. But yeah. for whatever reason, uh, you were burning pizzas and burning days. <laughs> yep. Burning pizzas <laughs> and burning days. <laughs> well, um, one thing I wanted to say is I do come bearing gifts for your audience um, if someone Thanks. is struggling with sex or porn addiction, if they go to PowerfulEric.com, they can get a free copy of my audiobook called Everything You Know About Sex and Porn Addiction is Wrong, The 21 Myths About Sex and Porn Addiction. Um, or if you, and or if you want something that's uh, like has my story and stuff in that, there's a number one Amazon bestseller called Think Big that you can also get a copy of that from my website, PowerfulEric.com. And um, I would love to uh, hear from them. We have to come up with your power name. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the things that some guys do is they take their first name and then they take a, a positive adjective that starts the same letter. So uh, it's... Um, my name's Todd. So like Todd Terrific, uh, Terrific Todd. Uh, what other things start with a T? I'm remiss at the moment. Tremendous. Tremendous. <laughs> And then your initials could be TT. <laughs> TT uh -huh. is in the house. <laughs> uh, but I like TTs. <laughs> I better not. <laughs> Trem Tremendous Todd. Tremendous I like it. Tremendous Todd. It doesn't have to be a T. It could be something completely different, but that could be at least the temporary <laughs> holder, the space holder. Tremendous Todd. <laughs> That's my wrestling name. Here's your host. Tremendous Todd. <laughs> Please, my friends call me TT. <laughs> <laughs>thank you so much, Eric. Thank you for sharing uh, you know, your journey and for helping so many other people. You've touched on a lot of things I've never considered or thought about, so I appreciate that very, very much. Another thing I appreciate very much is when people buy me a coffee or they go to the merch store and they buy some merch. I also have a children's book. It's called Sometimes Daddy Cries. You can also go check that out on Amazon. Oh, you know what? I don't think that's in the show notes. I'm going to start putting it in the show notes. I hate to sound like, I don't know. I, I, I hate asking people for things. <laughs> So this is hard for me, but you know, this is a full-time job. I get paid almost, well, um, very, very little. Let's put it that way. Uh, so every little bit helps. And with every little bit that helps, the more episodes I can come out with, with guests that are talking about incredibly powerful things, the more people can feel not alone when they hear my guests talk about their ailments. And yeah, lots of people are getting help and, uh, you know, I'm getting lots of great feedback from listeners about my guests all the time so why deny someone that if you know what i'm saying anyway my point is <laughs> please if you feel so inclined to buy me a coffee buy some merch uh, buy my kids book or even rating and reviewing and sharing the podcast it's all very very much appreciated and it it, it does much more than you actually think it does but anyway that's my little my little spiel for today until next time, please remember to make your beds and take your meds. Bye.